that is the greatest gift that the church has for the world it is the gospel the gospel is holistic that's why Jesus said the spirit of the Lord God is upon me he has anointed me to preach the good news but also to do what to bite the broken hearted to comfort those who mourn and to provide for those who mourn in Zion God is shaking that which can be shaken so that what is unshakable may remain Haggai says when these men of God lived in their day they did not know that it would be recorded in the Bible that we are reading today what they were doing was just living for God one day at a time the cross represents the greatest adversity that one can experience Jesus endured the cross and overcame so that in adversity we may have hope every person is under pressure economies are strained left right and center how can we endure how can we stand strong from this moment and this is the prayer that i pray for you i pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and i pray that you will be rooted and established in love i'm glad to see every one of you this is grace hill mission church where the lord writes beautiful stories and indeed the lord has been very gracious he has continued to write beautiful stories now we continue with our sermon series trust the process god is at work and this is an expository lesson or lessons from the book of habakkuk and so far the series so far our pastors robert and pastor grace have led us in the last couple of weeks and um we began with the first part of the series god's timing sometimes his delays seem to hurt god's ways sometimes his methods do not make sense we just don't understand last sunday god's compass his word is our compass the liberation of his word along our journey today we come to the fourth one the anchor of our faith the anchor of our faith now we need both the compass which is the word of god and the anchor as is we sail through life's ocean the word of god is more than a compass as we know it is also um, a, a rock on which we anchor as we continue with our journey and that anchor is faith indeed the bible shows us how they go together hebrews chapter 4 and verse 2 says the gospel was preached to them to uh, sorry the gospel was preached to us as well as to them but the word which they heard did not profit them not being mixed with faith in those who heard it did you hear that because the word and faith go together the word did not profit them because air was not mixed with faith by those who had it so we need both the compass the word of god but we also need the anchor which is faith we need to mix the word of god with faith today's text habakkuk chapter uh, 2 and verse 4 we look at it but we shall also be uh, looking at several other verses in habakkuk indeed we because this is the central verse in habakkuk is the, the core message of habakkuk is what we are reading today and that's why you will be going back to chapter one chapter two we are at the core verse see the enemy has puffed up is puffed up babylon that is his desires are not upright but the righteous person will live by his faithfulness or the righteous will live by faith the righteous will live by faith now this text has two dimensions first of all there is the immediate context 
faith lessons that we draw from Habakkuk the prophet. What's the life of the righteous like? How do the righteous live by faith? How does he illustrate the life of a person living by faith? Both by his own life and by the scriptures. And then we have the broader context. Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 4 has been quoted in the New Testament at least three times. And in all those quotations, or at least in two of them, which is um, um, Romans chapter 1 and verse 17, and Galatians chapter 3 and verse 11, it is applied to salvation, teaching us that the only way to receive salvation is through faith in Jesus Christ. This is one of the most verses in the New Testament, uh, in the Old Testament, as far as the foundation of our faith in Jesus Christ is concerned. And next Sunday we shall devote our time just to look at it from that perspective. But today we explore the immediate context. Faith lessons that we can draw from Habakkuk's life and experiences. Number one, the first lesson we learn from him is this. The faith of the righteous will be tested. The faith of the righteous will be tried. Now, Habakkuk's faith, as you might have realized by now through this series, was stretched and tried by what he saw and what he experienced. He saw the righteous suffering and he saw the wicked prospering. He looked and he was petrified by the pain he saw because of the injustice that was there in the land. The righteous people were hemmed in by the wicked. God seemed to be doing nothing about it. He had questions. He had many thoughts. And so what we get from the scriptures is um, the trying faith for this prophet. Now faith that starts the test, faith that starts trial, is not a self-deceiving kind of faith. It is not presumptive. It is the kind of faith that is honest about its struggles. It seeks questions. It pursues God. You see, faith can be presumptive. When you are hiding the reality of your doubts, when you are hiding the reality of your pains, when you are hiding the reality of the things that you cannot understand. But Habakkuk, very boldly, bears his frustrations and questions before God. He asked God, as we have seen in the series so far, why? He asked God, how long? Why does evil prosper? Why are the wicked suffering? Why do you use wicked Babylon to punish us and we are more righteous than them? Now, for an illustration of what we mean by not being self-deceiving, but <clears throat> accepting our weakness and bearing it before God. Let me give you the example of Jeremiah. And you need to understand that Jeremiah was a contemporary of Habakkuk. They actually prophesied at the same time, around the same time. He too was honest, perhaps much more than Jeremiah, with God about the trying of his faith. Maybe he even could have influenced the honesty of Habakkuk because they were contemporary. Jeremiah chapter 15 verse 8. You know, some people really wonder when they see how Jeremiah was open with God. The things that he told God. But Jeremiah 15 verse 8, he tells God, Why is my pain an adding and my wood grievous and incurable? You are to me like a deceptive brook. Like a spring that fails. What is he saying? He is telling God. I had thought I could trust you. But you have become like the river that is seasonal. Like a seasonal river. Yesterday I was there. There was water. But today I come hopeful. But there is no water. Because the river is seasonal. I expected you like my God. 
to be faithful in summer, to be faithful in winter, to be like a river, that's a brook that never fails. But I feel like you have failed me. You know, in chapter 20, he was even more um, firmer than that, more audacious than that. He told God, God, you have deceived me and I have been taken in your lies. When I accepted to follow you into this ministry, I didn't know how painful it would be. You never told me. Now I'm the laughing stock of everybody. It is painful all around. I feel like you have deceived me. Sometimes I do not want to preach. But your word becomes like a fire in my bones. I, you, you have overcome me. And you would think that God, people, what? You would expect that God would just remove his sword and just finish this. Who is he? Just a speck of dust and just finish him. Who are you to talk to me like that? But God appreciated that honesty. And he answers Jeremiah here in this context, verse 19, the very next verse. If you repent, very graciously, I will restore you to, that you may serve me. If you utter worthy, not worthless things, you'll be my spokesman. In other words, I'm not done with you. I'm not looking for another prophet. You may have spoken many things. You may have called me a deceptive brook, but I am not looking for another prophet. I hear you. This is the way we are going to do it. Repent. I'll teach you to speak worthy things, not unworthy things. These people should turn to you. Now you have begun talking like them. The same ones you have been prophesying to. The same ones you have been speaking against. You have become like them. Now don't turn to them. God is teaching him. Do you see that? But let them turn to you. In other words, God stoops and comes at his level. And he tells him, now you see, you have been influenced by the people. Romans chapter 12 and verse 3, leading from the New Living Translation, the Bible says, be honest in your evaluation of yourself, measuring yourself by the faith that God gives us. Faith that starts the test that will persevere during trial is based and founded on knowledge. It is not, as they say, a blind leap of faith. It is founded on knowledge. Biblical faith is not empty faith. Biblical faith is not based upon our feelings. Biblical faith is not based upon emotions. No. It is founded on knowledge. The knowledge of the word of God. And God responds to our desire to know and understand him. To grow in faith. Do you remember Job? Job says, if I was given an opportunity, I want to speak to God face to face. I want to lay my case before him. I want to tell him how I feel. They think I'm a sinner, but I know I'm righteous. God seems to have risen against me. He seems to be obscured in darkness. Too strong for me. But I believe him. My desire is that I would see him face to face. And finally God appeared. And he said, who is that who was obscuring knowledge, speaking without knowledge? I have come. He says, your coming is enough. Your coming is enough. I have nothing to say. I repent in dust and ashes. But just to show that God honors our desire to know him. He honors our desire to understand him. That's the kind of God we serve. Do not deny your faith struggles. Authenticity, honesty, lays the foundation for growth. One of the things I like when I sit down with my children, and now they are, they are not so much children, and they are listening to me now, <laughs> is that they bear their faith. They, bear their, they ask questions. Dad, do you think God meant this? We were been studying the book of Revelation. Hey, uh, and it, it can scare. You know? And they're asking questions. They ask, do you think God Lire would want us to become rich? How come we have read so much this week? God say, the, you know, things against, the, against the, the, the rich. They ask questions. I always tell 
Salome, those are the most beautiful moments of parenting. Because I acknowledge those questions. But even more importantly, God acknowledges those questions. As we seek him. Seek answers. Seek growth. Wrestle with the questions in the world. We learn from Habakkuk that the more we, we intimately dialogue with God, the more we ask our questions genuinely, the more our faith grows. The Bible says, remember I am saying, biblical faith is built on knowledge. And look at Romans 10 and verse 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Faith comes by knowing the word of God. Faith comes by understanding the word. Faith comes by delving deeper into the word. The Bible says, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, His divine power has given us all things pertaining to this life and godliness. Everybody say amen. That is beautiful. Oh, God has given us everything that pertains to, to life and godliness. But how do we get these things? By faith. But what kind of faith? It says, through the knowledge of him who called us according to his glory. It is the knowledge of God on which our faith is built. On which our faith is built. You see, Habakkuk begins in chapter 1, as Pastor Robert uh, um, helped us to see, he begins with a sigh, or as he put it, with a question. Yeah? With many questions. In fact, he begins this way. How long? What a way to begin a book. How, what a way to begin prayers. But that's the way he begins. Yeah? How long? How long? But he does not add with a sigh. He adds with a song. At the end of it, as we shall see. Because when he starts engaging with God, asking God how long, why, when, as he becomes more and more intimate with God, as he receives liberation, as he is told, write this liberation, as he receives liberation, and he feels the embrace of God's love, as he understands the word of God, now he begins to know. His faith grows. His faith depends. And where there was how long, he lifts up his hands and says, even though the fig trees do not blossom, even though the cow pens are empty, whatever happens, I will praise the Lord. Blessed be the name of Jesus. Because walking with God in his word brings us to the place of growth in faith. Habakkuk's example invites us to consider Hosea chapter 6 and verse 3. And it says, oh, that we might know the Lord. Let us press on to know him. He will respond to us. Number two, the righteous, the faith of the righteous will not only be tried, but that faith of the righteous believes in a God who is in vote and a God who is in charge. Many times we feel like God has gone out. He is not there. Habakkuk's um, Habakkuk's dilemma is that God is indifferent and detached from our world. God is not there. He's detached from our world. Does he see? Does he feel? Will God act? When will he act? He says, how long must I cry to you? Verse 2 to 4 of chapter 1. Violence you do not save. The law is paralyzed because and justice is perverted. Justice is perverted. Because he's crying about the injustice of his day. Then he says, your eyes are too evil. <laughs> your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. But why do you seem to be tolerating the treacherous? You know, some years ago, a researcher who was a Christian commissioned a poll that had only one question. They had only one question. What? The question is this. What one question would you ask God if you physically met him today? What one question 
would you ask God if you physically met him today? Now, the results came in. The number one question for most people, actually at 75%, was this question. Why is there so much evil in the world? And why can't you do something about it? Don't we feel that sometimes? That is the dilemma of Habakkuk. The second question coming in close at 20 something percent is God. If you just met God walking and you are told this is God. Not in heaven here. Yeah. Many people would ask him, God, are you really in charge? Are you in charge? Because it appears like evil is in charge. Like another power is in charge. Like a good God is not in charge. These are the real questions that Habakkuk is, is, is lessoning with. One great lesson from Habakkuk is that God is involved and he is in charge. He allows all things to happen with a purpose. In the midst of injustice and in pain, the just shall live by faith, believing and being fully persuaded that God is concerned with the current pains and injustice. And in the fullness of time, he will act. Is God concerned as COVID-19 millions are making overnight millionaires? Does God see? I was saying how, watching the news, I was telling my wife, in fact, I was telling, I, I don't want to watch the news. Because I was telling her, I feel like an activist. You know, I feel like I, like I can go to Uhuru Park. Even one is going. Omutata. <laughs> like I can go and join him where, you know, chain him myself where he, I felt bad. You know? And Habakkuk is feeling that. Asking God, can't you see? Can't you see the corruption in our nation? Can't you see the evil in our land? Can't you see the injustice? Can't you see it? But Habakkuk learned that God had a plan and was in full control. That all things would ultimately bow and serve his purpose. When God seems distant and we get closer to him, then we begin to understand that God has a plan. Listen to God's answer. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 6 to 13. The Bible says, God says, Oh, what sorrow. If you have, this is the New Living Translation. Most of the other Bibles would say, Oh, unto you. Oh, what pain for the person. Oh, what sorrow awaits you this. Okay? So this is the message that the COVID-19 this should hear. And all the other lords of corruption in our nation. Now you will get what you deserve. In fact, you see dot, dot, dot there. God is asking, how long do you think you can go on with such kind of injustice? Verse 9. Oh, what sorrow awaits you who build big houses with money that has gained his honesty. What sorrow? Because our God sees and our God is concerned. That is the message of Habakkuk. You believe that your wealth will buy you security. Verse 10. But by, your, the murders, by the murders you have committed, you have shamed your name. That's God speaking, not Habakkuk. You have shamed your name. But what sorrow awaits you who build cities with money gained through murder and corruption? Has not the Lord promised they work so hard, but all their work is in vain. What is God telling Habakkuk? He is telling him, my son, my prophet, I am in charge. I see the injustice. I see the pain. I see what is happening. And I will act. Blessed be the name of Jesus. God will judge next Sunday as you look at uh, Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4 from another dimension. We shall be reminding ourselves that faith trebles at the righteousness of God. And it is important for us to remind ourselves, even when we seem to be living in darkness, 
There is a God who sees. There is a God who hears. Habakkuk then has a conclusion. That's the way he concludes chapter 2. The last verse is verse 20. After hearing the Lord answer his complaints. Remember, chapter 2 begins by saying, begins with these words. I will station myself at my watch and I will hear what God will say so that I will know how to answer to my complaint. That I know how I'm going to deal with my questions. After he hears the Lord describe what is awaiting the wicked. This is his conclusion. He says the Lord is, his, is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. Let all the earth be silent before him. He says, wow, our God is able. Our God is powerful. Our God will act. Our God will judge. In the fullness of time, as we say next Sunday, God will judge the unrighteousness of men. So let us, let all the earth be silent. Because the silence of God does not mean the inactivity of God. The silence of God does not mean the inability of God. The silence of God does not mean the inaction of God. God will act. Blessed be the holiness of his name. Amen. Number three. The righteous labor to faithfully represent God correctly in this perverted world. That is what Habakkuk learns. The world is full of unrighteousness. The world is full of evil. In fact, in verse 3, he says the righteous are hemmed in by the unrighteous. The, the, the unrighteous are the most prominent people. They are the ones who seem to be ruling. They are the ones who seem to have the greatest voice. Sometimes I look at our nation and I feel like Habakkuk. And I ask myself, what can be done? I look at the unrighteousness. And sometimes you look at the political class and you do not see where our hope is going to come from. You, 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 you need just to have been here for the short time I have been alive. You know, and to follow our politicians down the road and to see that you know, if our hope was to be in the politicians. A politician can be on this side today, but can be on that side tomorrow. And we can feel hopeless as we look at the injustices that are all around us. But what can we do? Habakkuk learns an important lesson. In this perverted world, the, the righteous will live by faith. The righteous will live by faith. In other words, God is looking for a remnant. God is looking for soul. God is looking for life. Habakkuk, the world is dark around you. Habakkuk, the world is wicked around you. But you shall live differently. The just shall live by faith. Amen. Those who live by faith shine brightly for God in this dark world. For we are the light of the world. In our study in Philippians which we concluded just recently. Philippians chapter 1 verse 11, we remind ourselves, Paul says we must be filled with the fruit of righteousness that come through the Lord Jesus Christ. But in verse 9, he explains where that righteousness comes from. He says righteousness that comes from God through faith. Romans chapter 2 verse 21 to 22. You then who teach others, do you teach yourself? While you teach, you who teach others against stealing. Do you steal? The just shall live by faith. Are you living like the just? Are you living like the righteous? Yeah? The other day, I think last Sunday, I was stopped by a policeman at a leading church. And he wanted to see my, my, my license. I said, um, Uber license, the other uh, like you know, a new for us. The app is down. Uh, the application. But he began telling me the importance of carrying the, uh, the license. He was very, very, very kind. Then he said, uh, "Have a seat." We were talking with my wife, and we were saying, "That is one different policy." You know, everyone seems to be looking for an opportunity to break right. Yeah? But I ask myself, you that says do not, 
you know, our leaders are corrupt. Are you corrupt? You didn't have an opportunity. Yeah? Yeah. But you, who says do not steal, do you steal? You that says do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? Oh, my time. Number four. So that we must represent God. The righteous must live by faith. And finally, the righteous partner with God in prayer, through prayer. There are many other ways, and I think we'll come back to that. The, by the way, the book of Habakkuk is one of the most important book, books in uh, what we call social justice, especially the Christian perspective on social justice. And we'll be touching on that in another sermon as we go through. Habakkuk. But the righteous partner with God through prayer to see his kingdom established in the world. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Habakkuk's prayer is outstanding because he clearly expects God to act. He clearly expects God to work. He clearly expects God to do something about it. Habakkuk's prayer is very outstanding in its expectancy. He says, how long? I want salvation, but I don't seem to be seeing it. How long? How long? He says, I will climb to my watchtower, as we have just said. I will wait. His prayer is outstanding in its expectancy. Friends, as you look at what is happening in our world, and in especially in our nation, do we live as a people who actually show that we believe in the power of prayer? I was working here this week, and I was seated somewhere in the corner. You know now, uh, in, with COVID-19, corner, you know? And uh, so I was seated somewhere here. And a lady came in. In fact, I want them to ask who she is later. But I always see her near, in, in a homestead near here. And uh, she said, I said, oh, can I help you? I thought it's those who come for food, uh, aid, the Jirani basket. So can I help you? You came to see her grief? No. I came to pray. I came to talk with God. So I said, uh, because I'm working here, let me show you another place you can go and pray. Then she told me, no. My prayers don't disturb anyone. <laughs> you see, in my, her prayers don't disturb anyone. So she took a seat and went to that corner and knelt. And silently, I worked on my computer. She spoke to God. After she was done, she woke up and said, thank you, pastor. I have finished. You know, as we pray, do you believe that your prayer will bring results? The prayer of a righteous man, James says in chapter 5, verse 16, is powerful and effective. Powerful and effective. The prayer of the righteous is persevering and consistent. As you pray and wait on God, this sometimes is very easy to get weary. It is very easy to get tired. It is very easy to get to the place where you, you, cannot, uh, you cannot move on. Jesus, uh, a, major, a major theme of Habakkuk is waiting. And to wait on God effectively, we must then watch against weariness. We must watch against getting tired. Living, Jesus said, men always ought to pray and not to faint. Living by faith means looking up to God daily for renewed strength. And I need to give us a scripture as we make the correction there. That is not Hebrews chapter 10, verse 37 to 39. Uh, it is Jeremiah chapter, what we are about to read is Jeremiah chapter 40 and verse 29 to uh, 31. We could have read Hebrews chapter 10, but time does not allow us. The Bible says, God gives strength to the weary. And he increases the power of the weak. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. I don't know that there is a better time to ask God for renewal of strength. To be able to stand and wait like Habakkuk on your watch. And pray for our nation. And pray for our Lord. And pray for the church of Jesus Christ. Worship team. The Bible says they will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. 
they will walk and they will not fail. They will walk and they will not fail. That is the promise of the word of God. Remember, we are looking at Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. The righteous shall live by faith. All right? And we are saying, Habakkuk said, I will wait. In that waiting, there can be weariness. There can be tiredness. Even the things we go through, the pain, not only the things we hear like Habakkuk and what we are hearing from the news, but also the things we go through. Some of us have experienced loss of jobs. Some of us have experienced the sickness of loved ones. Some of us have experienced many things. There can be weariness. But the God we believe in renews the strength of the weary. Blessed be the name of Jesus. Let's stand up in the presence of the Lord. As I pray and conclude, Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16 is an invitation from God. And the invitation says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help us in the time of need. Would you lift up your hands to the Lord? Would you come boldly to the throne of grace? Would you come boldly to the throne of mercy? Would you come boldly to the presence of God, that you may find grace to help in the time of need? Would you just lift up your hands to the Lord? Just lift up your hands to the Lord. Why don't you speak to him? Why don't you talk to him and tell him, Lord, I approach and bring and confess all my weaknesses. I confess all my weaknesses. I confess all my doubts. I confess all my fears. I confess all my weaknesses. Lord, I do not want to think of myself more highly than I ought. But I want you to know. I want you to know the weaknesses that I have within. The doubts. The questions, the fears that I have within. All these things, God, I need you. Renew my strength. Let us approach and confess our weaknesses to him. Let us approach for strength so that we can walk by faith because the righteous shall live by faith. Let us approach him for renewal of strength that we may soar by faith, that we may walk by faith. Blessed be the name of Jesus that we may soar by faith, that we may walk by faith. Let us approach to receive a clear vision, clear instructions, that we may represent his kingdom effectively. Why don't you speak to the Lord? And tell the Lord, yes, Lord, I hear you. And I understand that just will live by faith. And how I pray that you may renew my faith. You may renew my strength, oh God. I may have a lot of questions concerning our Lord concerning our nation many things that trouble us concerning my own life concerning my family but lord i choose to live with a faith that is convinced that you are involved that you are concerned that you are present and that you will act oh we give you praise jesus we thank you lord god almighty we love you lord the just will live by faith and perhaps you have never started the work of faith. If you are listening to us online or in this sanctuary and you have never known the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal savior, I'll be glad to lead you in a prayer of faith. If you are in here, you can just lift up your hand and say, Jesus, I want to know you as my savior. If you are here, you are not born again. You have never received Jesus. You have never said, Jesus, come into my heart. Why don't you lift up your hand and I'll be glad to pray with you. And if you are out there, why don't you allow the Lord to speak to you as you commit your heart to him in the name of the Lord and tell him, dear Lord, I am a sinner. Dear Lord, come into my heart. I pray that you may forgive me. I pray that you may, that, that you may help me to start living by the faith that comes in the Lord Jesus Christ. I commit, I give my life to you. I surrender fully to you. Lord, I pray for your people. I pray that, Lord, you may help us to walk by faith every single day, every single moment. May you bless us in our going out and may you bless us in our coming in. May you bless us in the labors of our, of our hands, oh God. May you provide our food and our water and bless it, Lord. And I ask you, Jesus, that you would walk before us to level every mountain, view every valley because the just shall live by faith. 
you bless our nation and thank you because you are involved even though there are so many terrible things that we hear and see god you are fighting for this land in your time you will intervene and you are intervening for kenya we love you and we thank you for this is our prayer in jesus name amen let's celebrate the lord let's celebrate the lord in jesus name and now may the grace of our lord jesus christ and the love of god and the fellowship of the holy spirit be with you now and forevermore amen and amen and amen we celebrate the lord amen <laughs>